And I remember there was one particular day, random day, daylight, out playing with friends and these police tanks just come into the neighborhood, right? They drive in a few of them and everybody just starts scattering. So this is my first experience of anything like this. So we all running into neighbors' houses. Next thing, there is this painful, sharp, gas that starts burning my eyes and my nose and you can't breathe properly and everything hurts and you're coughing and I'm just like what is this thing and that's when I first experienced and knew or learned about tear gas. This is one of Sile Bolani's earliest memories of growing up in apartheid South Africa. It was sometime in the 1980s and she was about six years old. Randomly There was no commotion, there was no struggle, there was no anything that would trigger that kind of response from the police. Sitle is a corporate consultant. She tackles racism and sexism in the private sector. She's also the author of We Are the Ones We Need, her memoir and survival guide for young black women in corporate. The book is set in the offices and boardrooms of big companies in Joburg. But the truth is that Sidle's fight for equality started way before then, back on the township streets where she played. And it was actually quite a traumatic experience because you truly get to understand how power is abused by people um, when they can just do it, you know, when there's no, no structures, no accountability, no equality, no viewing people as humans. Um, when you are in a position of privilege and a position of power. Back then, Sitle's world was black. Her friends, family, neighbors, all looked like her until the year that everything changed in South Africa. Okay, Mandela gets out of prison and everybody's celebrating. And I'm like, who's this guy? (laughs) Why is everybody so happy, (laughs) you know? Then I get educated about him. Okay, fantastic. So now we can go to the white schools. So off you go, you're excited to go to this school, new school in this affluent area that you've never been to before, you've never even heard of it. I certainly felt very insecure about myself because I'm in an environment that I'm not used to. I don't know how to act. I don't know what to expect or to anticipate. Obviously, studying in a, in a white area, being surrounded by white kids meant that I had white friends. Yes, I had some black friends, but a lot of my friends at school were white. And you think you're all friends and you're all equal until they find ways to remind you that you're not actually one of them. If there's a disagreement or if there's a a, a power play that they want to have, they find a way, even at that young age of eight, nine, ten years old, they were able to make me feel like I don't belong if there was any kind of conflict that, you know, popped up. And so, you know, even with those experiences, I still thought, well, when I thought about my life, when I thought about my future, I mean, I didn't think that far ahead, but I never imagined a life of struggle as far as race relations are concerned. I never imagined that life would carry challenges purely because I'm a woman. I never imagined that I would struggle at work to get recognition, to be paid equally, to be given space to be myself, to be able to use my voice in the ways in which I feel I need to use my voice to express myself. The City of Gold holds promises of success and wealth for hardworking, educated Black professionals but there are obstacles along the way. Toxic corporate culture threatens to break their hearts, minds, and spirits. In Sile's case, the toll became physical. This is Sile's story of fighting discrimination in the workplace and finding a new direction for her life in the process. Welcome to Golden City. I'm your host, Zanel MG, and I love a good story. This podcast is a collection of the greatest stories I've ever heard about the city of gold, Johannesburg, South Africa. In each episode, you'll meet a different Joburger who will tell you their own true stories in their own words. All the ups and downs, adventures, lessons, wins and losses that make life in Joburg truly interesting. 
This concrete jungle may not have mountains or beaches to compete with the natural beauty of other South African cities, but the diverse and amazing people who call Johannesburg home make this golden city shine bright. What a story. How do you feel about that? Tell me more. The night Sitli ended up in the hospital, she was working late as usual. Made myself dinner. And while I was having dinner, I was sitting in bed and working on my laptop. And then um, finished eating and got up to take my plate to the kitchen and grabbed my phone with me, just out of habit, you know. Went to the kitchen. As I got to the kitchen, I just got the sharp pain in my chest. It was the most excruciating pain I've ever felt. And I don't know what was happening. Um, and so at first I was like, okay, let me just breathe through it. Maybe it's just like, maybe it's heartburn. Eventually it got so bad, I called someone. They came, they picked me up, they took me to uh, the emergency room. And they did a whole bunch of tests. Um, and obviously lying there in that room and on that bed in the ER and waiting for the results from the tests. And I'm responding to emails. 11 p.m. in a hospital bed connected to a drip, I'm responding to emails. <laughs> I was like, if this is not the height of insanity, then I don't know. Sisi wasn't insane. She was under extreme pressure at work. And the results came through. It was stress. Um, and, you know, the doctor was just like, if you don't change something, you will have a heart attack. And I think I was like 32 at the time. What 32-year-old ever dreams that they will hear that they're at risk of having a heart attack? And all of this because of a company, because of one, per- because of a woman who is supported by a company that enables this type of behavior and this type of bullying. Ten years ago, Sisley had graduated top of her class, ready to achieve her big career ambitions. Um, I majored in PR adver- and advertising. So when I finished uh, my, my, my studies, I was 22, uh, single parent, um, but also the only person in my in my graduating class who had already secured a job. Started my first job uh, when I joined an insurance company as part of their graduate program. But soon after starting, Sisley quickly noticed certain differences between herself and her white colleagues. And where I started to realize that there is a complexity within the workplace as far as race is concerned, at least at that point, um, is that... The people around me who had joined with me, who were graduates with me, seemed to have more money than me at the end of the month. They seemed to have more access to uh, senior people in the organization than I did. You know, when people will walk past each other and share a joke or reference something that happened earlier and be able to laugh about it. And you're thinking, when did this even happen? When did this connection even happen or this introduction? Because these people seem so familiar with each other. To Sisle, that access benefited white employees in ways that seemed blatantly unfair. So there was a position that opened up within our department, and I said to the head of the department that I'm interested in applying for the position. And he said to me, "Mm, I don't think you're ready for it, because he had already earmarked somebody else as part of our graduate program to take up that position. So he didn't even consider it, didn't even allow me to go through the process. He was just like, girl, don't even try it, which was very, very hurtful. A little while later, another position opened up for a junior brand manager position for the group, and I applied for that, and I got that position. So that was, you know, my first promotion. Things only got worse after Sisle was promoted. I worked with, um, I reported into uh, the brand manager for the group who was an older white woman, and We had a lot of issues shortly into uh, our relationship as manager and, you know, (laughs) subordinate um, because we had gotten along well before. But now once I'm doing the work, I'm now just like an administrator. Uh, You know, I'm the person that she says, oh, uh, just make sure that you fill out the application so that when the yellow pages comes out, they've got our updated contact details for the company. Oh, go and order T-shirts for this. Oh, go and... And I was just like, "Mm, (laughs) ma'am, this is not going to help me grow. (laughs) If all I'm doing is the stuff that you just don't want to do, 
you know, but I'm not doing anything strategic. You're not exposing me to anything that's going to develop me and going to help me grow. You're not taking me into meetings that I should be part of to be able to understand the environment, uh, you know, uh, a bit better. And the more I would bring it up in our meetings to say, okay, so what's your plan for my development? Okay, so but what's the what, but what's the plan? Okay, I hear you, but what's the plan? Where are we going with this? And the more I would ask about it, the more defensive and aggressive she would get about it. And so our relationship started deteriorating. At the time, I think I was probably like about maybe 20. See, I started when I was 20. So maybe I was like about 24 or so. I started developing arthritic symptoms from the stress. Sitle's hands and arms were so painful that she struggled to carry her toddler daughter. And I was just like, I'm too young for this. <laughs> um, so I quit. Um, it definitely was the beginning of me understanding that a marriage plays a very small role in your success in the workplace. Um, but it also showed me that speaking up comes with very, very severe consequences. While she was still at the insurance company, Sitle had been headhunted by one of the major South African banks. She had turned them down a couple of times, but now that she was looking for a fresh start, something new, she agreed to an interview. It was at the head office, a large grey building downtown. I drive into the parking lot and just everything is dark, everything is grey, everything is cold. And I was just like, I hate everything about this place. You know, there's nothing welcoming here. There's nothing that says... We're the place you want to work, you know, visually at least. There was not, there was, the energy didn't feel warm and welcoming and, you know. But you see the people and they're smiling so nicely and they seem warm. But then it's, you know, it's like the opposite of what you're feeling inside. So it was very, it was very confusing. And that's what I wanted to ask you. Looking back now, do you think that was your intuition speaking to you? I mean, in the book, you described it as my spirit rejected the idea of being at that bang. What role do you think intuition and instincts play in a young professional's journey? Like how seriously should they take their gut feelings and their instincts and how do they understand and interpret those types of things? Uh, It most certainly was an instinctual response. Um, but I do want to qualify it by saying that sometimes our, our, our instincts or our gut feeling is telling us to avoid danger, right? So flee, right? But sometimes that instinct is saying to you, go, but go away. So don't have your guard down. But I think it is important for for us to be able to get to work towards getting to a point where we are able to listen and hear, uh, listen to and hear our, our our gut when it's speaking to us. To be able to know when it's your gut, to be able to know when it's just anxiety, to be able to know when it's just fear, to be able to know when it's excitement. Because sometimes those things can all feel the same. And I think it's so important for us to spend time getting to know ourselves, spending time listening to our bodies and asking asking ourselves questions quietly, internally, and listening to how our bodies respond to those questions to be able to tell when something feels right or when it doesn't. What that instinct was trying to tell me, which I didn't quite understand at the time, was, sure, but girl, <laughs> you better have your bullets ready because here... <laughs> It's going to be lit. You start at the bank. Can you tell me some of your observations that you made about the racial dynamics, just within your first impression? What did you see in your department um, in terms of the difference between black and white colleagues? Gosh, what didn't I see? That white people socialize with each other outside of work and never invite the black people. (laughs) Um, That white people open doors for each other and give each other access that other people, white Black people and colored people don't have within the workplace. Um, that white people get promoted at a faster rate than black people, even if they are not as qualified or as experienced. That white people are paid more than black people. And it's justified with <laughs> even things like, well, you know, 
he's married, he has a family to look after. And so we should, we need to just give him a bit of a pay increase so that he can manage his expenses. Do we not have responsibilities? But also, are we not doing a job here that requires remuneration that is at the appropriate and fair rate? Um, but also just in terms of the levels of protection. White people were very protected. They were shielded. If they made a mistake, it was, don't worry, we'll, we'll fix it, or whatever the case was. They were able to, you know, wiggle out of it because they had some form of sponsorship. Whereas we didn't. We got into trouble. If you get into trouble, you get into trouble. You get escalated, you get escalated. Nobody is going to protect you, you, you know. She also noticed that her Black, Indian, and colored colleagues were struggling. They were getting booked off work, being checked into hospital, being unable to function, like one after the other. I was like, no, there's a problem here. There's a very, very big problem here. Then the issue started between Sile and her own line manager. There were two events that were coming up and they attract different audiences in terms of the media. So who you invite is very different and where they publish that content is very different. And so she was upset that I had said that these events can happen on the same day. They, 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 were, they were both very urgent things that needed to be launched. So she storms over to me, open plan, and she goes, I've just been told that this is what you have done. And she goes off and tells me about how I've screwed it up and how I've done this, that and the other and how I better fix it. And I should know better. And I was too shocked in that moment to respond. Um, because I've never had anybody behave in that way or treat me in that way. Um, and I remember she, after she finished saying what she needed to say, I didn't get a chance to say anything. She just turned and stormed off. And then, you know, when <laughs> you look around the room and everybody's like awkwardly trying to see if you're reacting in any way, but also trying to avoid eye contact. Like it was awkward. It was humiliating. I was so angry. Sile decided it was time to draw a boundary. So about two weeks later, I have a meeting with her. In the meeting, I then say to her, this is my boundary. You cannot ever speak to me like that. If there's something you want to discuss with me, you ask me to join you in a meeting, we set up a meeting or whatever. Don't ever speak to me like that. Don't ever shout at me, regardless of where we are or who's around. I will not tolerate that. And if we're going to have a difficulties with our relationship, then maybe we need to get some assistance from HR to help us manage it appropriately. Then she, then she lost it again. <laughs> and she was just like, you know, why do you want to get HR involved? You can't fight your own battles. Um, that's not even HR's job. HR's job is just to draw up policies. Um, and what are you going to say to them? You're going to tell them that your manager shouted at you. So this is the kind of person that you are. This is a red hearing for me about the kind of person that you are. Um, and if this is the game that you want to play, then fine. Let's play the game. That game was called constructive dismissal. Constructive dismissal is essentially a tactic that is used in workplaces where they make the workplace or your environment so untenable, so difficult for you to stay in that you have no choice but to leave. She first started attacking... Uh, my work. Nobody's happy with my work. None of my stakeholders know what I do. I don't add any value. Um, I don't contribute anything. I don't contribute anything in meetings. I just keep quiet all the time. I'm always on my laptop or on my iPad. I'm always, I'm, there was just, I'm rude to the PR agency, people that I got along with so well. Um, and, you know, and it was just, the most ridiculous thing. And this happened over the course of almost about 10 months, consistently, same messaging. Meanwhile, I have been able to, in my first year, I had been able to uh, produce PR results where our we overshot our target by 700%. But nobody knows what I do. I don't know how many days I cried from the time this woman started you know, ra waging this war against me. Basically, you're saying my entire existence sucks, you know? Um, and we fought, we fought a lot. We It got to a point where we just could not be, we could not have any meetings on our own. There had to be someone from HR in every single meeting. 
Um, I refused to have meetings with her without it being documented. I was privately recording every single conversation uh, because there was no trust whatsoever. And on her side, she was busy recruiting everyone and anyone to support this thing that I don't deliver. I don't perform well. I don't, I don't, I don't. And so in that period of eight to 10 months, I worked harder than I've ever worked, but also in the craziest way, the most unhealthy way, because I felt I had no other choice because I had no support. Um, I had no recourse. And all I literally had was myself. Um, and I knew what I had to lose, what I stand to lose if I let them win this battle. And that's how Sitle ended up in the hospital, processing the news that she was at risk of a heart attack at the age of 32. I asked Hitler whether she was supported or helped by the senior black executives in the company. And she told me this story. So when I moved to this new department, which was personal and business banking in South Africa, um, I was excited about going there because it was the CEO for that um, part of the business was a, a young black woman. And I was like, girl power, I'm about it. I'm trying to be in that energy, you know? Um, I was very excited about working in a part of the business that was led by a black woman because that was very aspirational for me. It was very inspiring. And I was so fascinated. I'd never met her, but I was so fascinated by just like, it's possible, you know? And that's why, you know, representation is such a big deal in that aspect. Because I was just like, wow, I can't wait to meet her. <laughs> my, my, um, fascination with her uh, was killed very, very quickly when I met her. So we walk into, so she had her own little meeting room next to her desk. And we walk into her meeting room and she's on her laptop typing away. So her business manager says, oh, by the way, so-and-so, um, this is Sikhle. She's the new, uh, she's running with marketing, I um, mean, with PR now and media. So she's going to be uh, sitting in on your interviews, in, in your interviews with you going forward. She never even looked up from her laptop to acknowledge my presence. She never said hi. She just carried on typing, said what she was saying to her business manager, whatever instructions she was giving her. And then she's like, okay, cool. Let's do this interview. I was like, I know you see me here. <laughs> I know you hear me. Oh, you, you consciously choose to ignore a young black woman standing in front of you. Ma'am, ma'am. And then I must listen to you in an interview talking about, well, you know, um, Leadership is so important to me and being a good leader is one of the key things. And, you know, I firmly believe in investing in and mentoring young black women. Oh, oh, oh. then I guess I must not be black because this, <laughs> you definitely did not see me. Her black seniors were sympathetic, but unhelpful. They would secretly acknowledge the fact that these issues are real, they exist, they know that they exist, they have seen it in some way, shape or form, but they won't formally address it. They won't formally raise it as an issue. They won't formally support you and, you know, um, and, and, and be your sponsors and stand up for you and back you up and protect you the way that white people get protected in the workplace. And so that for me was the more painful part of that experience, that disappointment, because these are people that we see as senior black people in organizations and we go, transformation, diversity, hey, be getting there. These guys are going to get us on the right track. They're going to fight the good fight for us. They're going to make sure that all of these inequalities get washed away because now they're in the positions of power. Why? <laughs> Why are they quiet? <laughs> 
self-protection. That's all it is. Protection of self, protection of own interests, and a disregard for collective progress, collective safety, um, a lack of concern for creating spaces for equality and justice within the workplace. So even if at their level, in their department, in their interactions, they may be experiencing something similar, they still won't see it as an opportunity to get together with other Black people and start to actually deal with the system, finesse the system in some way. That's why Sile titled her book, We Are the Ones We Need. None of us can turn things around on our own. Sile can't fight your battles for you. (laughs) But if we agree that this is a common battle that is important enough to all of us, that we're going to pool our resources, whether those resources are money, whether those resources are support, mental health support, whether those resources are legal support for people who need to challenge their organizations, whether that means um, HR advisory, whether that means building new businesses, whatever that form may take. Being hospitalized was a wake-up call for Sile. And I left the bank with no job, with no plan, with no nothing. I decided that this place is not for me because it will kill me. She's now the CEO of Sile Bolani Consulting. Her consultancy works with corporates on transforming organizational culture and addressing equity, diversity, and equality gaps. Sile also has a podcast called The Workplace Revolution. Welcome to The Workplace Revolution with me, Sile Bolani, where we will chat about all things career, life, society, professional justice, mental health. On the podcast, she discusses issues and challenges that are relevant to Black professionals. It all comes down to us recognizing that we need to take the initiative to take on the fight head on because it's not going to happen on our behalf through some magic. We're not going to wake up someday and corporate SA is go- white corporate SA is going to say, okay, guys, we're so sorry that we've been racist and unfair and not paying you what you should be earning. From tomorrow, we're going to do things the right way and we're going to be transparent. That's not going to happen. Every form of justice that we get, we're going to have to fight for. And until we're prepared to actually fight and understand that fighting is going to require taking risks, um, but we need to be, take those risks in order for us to achieve the ultimate outcome, which is to ensure that our children and their children are not experiencing the same thing we're experiencing. Since this interview, Sitle has published a second book, Nah, Keep Your Strength, is her deeply personal and honest account of life as an unmarried woman fighting the double standards and prejudices of African society. Thank you for visiting Golden City. If you liked this episode, like, follow, subscribe on all social media and streaming platforms. If you love this podcast, give us five stars. I'd love to feature you on Golden City. To submit your story, go to www.goldencitypodcast.co.za. See you next time.